Thank you. Um, so yes, I'll go ahead and dive right in. Um, so for those, I, I'm sure all of you know, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, what is Mailman? Mailman software for managing man uh, mailing list, and it's Python-based, Django-powered. Um, and usually for mailing lists, what do we think of? We think of there's typically two types, announce only or discussion lists, and these are just two examples. There are plenty of discussion uh, mailing lists out there. In fact, we have a lot of people using this platform. Um, a lot, it's really popular among open source projects. Uh, I just looked at the Portland universities, and these are the schools around the area that are locally that are using Mailman, but you can find many in, uh, in use in uh, nonprofits and universities. And of course, anyone you know, can do it themselves as well. So there's a lot of people who are using Mailman. And if we look at the history of the project itself, um, the first initial development of the project was in the mid-1990s. Um, first release was in 99, and then, you know, everyone's really excited. Next year, you got the next version. And then there's this huge gap. Uh, there's nine years of kind of uh, iterative work. There's like 2.1 right now, but there hasn't been a r major release in a, in a really long time. So we had the alpha version in 2009. Three years passed, we have beta one, and right now in April, uh, just a couple months ago, we had the the latest beta version rolled out. So um, in this talk, we're going to see what, uh, from the UI perspective, from the front end perspective, what's changed in 3.1 versus the previous version, which is 2.1. So in the old old version, um, there's basically two kind of components to the mailman. There's this, what they call Piper Mail, which handled the archiving of all the messages that you get in a mailing list. And then there's the admin UI, which is how you manage your list, how you administrate it, like manage who's on the list, set passwords and whatnot. So uh, for the purposes of this talk, we're only talking about the archiving per portion of it. And so this is what Piper Mail looked like in 2.1. Uh, this is what you would see when you wanted to get the main page, uh, equivalent of kind of the index page. It's basically a list of all the mailing lists on the server. Uh, and then you click on a list, you get this page, which is kind of admin plus kind of the overview combined into one page. Uh, if you clicked on the archives link um, for this particular list, you'd get a kind of a time base by default, a dump of links basically. And then from here, you could uh, pick on, let's say you want to view by thread for June, and you get another page of a dump of links, right? So um, it's a very, uh, and, and here, if you click on one of the specific messages, you'd get this kind of text-based view of a post. So it's, a, um, it's clearly, I, I don't think I have to convince anyone, it's, it's an outdated UI given how you know, web looks today, right? So, and because of that, we have a very clunky navigation. And by that, I mean it's very linear. You, know, you go from the archive view um, from on, the left, on the left to you know, the list for a month and then to a post. And if you want to jump back to another month, you kind of have to go back, back and then search again. So it's a very, uh, it kind of enforces one way to navigate uh, the discussion. And when uh, novices or first time kind of would be contributors to your mailing list come to, the, come to this page, uh, arguably it's maybe intimidating to them. It's just a page of links, they don't know where to start, it's very unclear. Um, everything looks kind of uh, just overwhelming because it's so many links, right? And this is especially true when you have very large mailing lists um, that's been active for many years. And it's also because it's just a flat page. Uh, it's really hard to get a big picture. Like, yes, there are all these uh, threads, but which is more important, what's been discussed. You kind of have to drill down all the way down to the lower level to get, the big, uh, to get a big picture. And you kind of have to spend a lot of time reading through a lot of posts. So, so that's a big kind of UI concern uh, up front. But there's also this problem as a result of having kind of uh, a, just a dump of all the links is that all the posts get buried, and there's no search uh, in Piper Mail. Uh, and there's, uh, as I mentioned before, all the lists are created equally. Um, so there's no sense of, is one more active than the other? What about private lists versus public lists? You basically have to click on the list, read the kind of information, and then discover that. So it's a lot of uh, hidden information. And all the posts within a mailing list are also created equal, right? So you have to, there's no sense of which threads and, and other than maybe seeing there are a lot of uh, responses to a thread, but you know, which ones are highly debated, which ones, which threads contain like really useful information for maybe new members, um, and which ones have uh, participants in the thread that are maybe from very expert users who have been around a lot or versus new subscribers who haven't. So there's, there's basically all this context that's kind of lost when you have this flat uh, layout of uh, links. 
Another thing that's missing in the Piper Mail UI is that it's uh, really hard to kind of for new members to identify trolls. And this is going back to the lack of context, right? You don't know who's posting for would be con kind of contributors who join. And so they don't have any information about the user the, uh, who's, uh, who's, who made a message. So for them, it can, can be hard to detect whether this is a good post or a bad post, right? And uh, along with that, when you see a post, you all, in Piper Mail, all you get is this kind of name and email address. And there's no way to kind of follow or subscribe to a user. You can reply back to the user, but that's kind of the extent of the interaction. So we're missing out on potentially richer kind of um, intra-list collaboration. So uh, these are kind of some of the UI problems that HyperKitty wants to solve in the 3.0 version. Um, and so if we look at the old uh, uh, architecture, a very simplified architecture, um, the new one is basically what enables all this enriched features is because there's this REST API. That's like the key big thing in the Mailman core engine. And because of that, bo both the HyperKitty um, and the admin, of course, would need that. But the HyperKitty also has access to the REST API. So now we can get some of the um, interactions that might have not been possible in the Piper Mail version. And so uh, how did we get to what HyperKitty looks like today? Um, and so this is kind of the, uh, uh, the process that we went, that was gone through. So there's, we first tested the waters, we did some sketching, we pared down all this brainstorming ideas we had, and then we kind of fleshed out the interaction flows and then we created a lot of mock-ups, right? So um, testing the waters out. So this is um, work that was driven by uh, Maureen Duffy, who works at Red Hat, and she was the, she did much of the upfront process that um, I'll talk about. But so in 2010, uh, she, basically wrote a blog post that was like, here are some new ideas I have about the UI. So it's just basically kind of testing the water, seeing is, are people receptive to kind of, I want a new look to Mailman, who's, who's on board with me? And so over like the course of two years, she met with a lot of people, she got a lot of um, responses to her blog post. And so she had, a, she had a good feeling that this is a good direction to go. Um, and of course in 2012, uh, what, what even made it better is that there's actual developer who, who was able to commit some time to it, time to the project. So with that, um, we can kind of move along to the other parts of the, of the, of the pipeline. So first what um, uh, Mo did was that she sketched out by hand um, all these like little, uh, if you can see all these little sketches here. And on her blog post, she kind of elaborated what each of her sketches. And she has like, uh, I think she came up with 32 ideas. So um, this is just six, half of those. Right, and, and, and nothing is off the kind of table for the, um, for the brainstorming part. Uh, some of them are a lot more like creative, there's like welcome gifts, and some, some are a lot more traditional, it's like user profiles, filtering tools. So in the, in the sketching and brainstorming stage, I think it's really important to kind of, you know, nothing is wrong, nothing is a bad idea. At this, at this point, we're just trying to be creative and see what we can come up with. And so from here, what happened was, uh, you know, we have 32, um, feature ideas essentially, and so we have to pare it down. We can't implement 32 versions and test them, um, even though we have this new developer who can help us. Um, so what we did is we have to understand and kind of prioritize which are the major features we want to address. Um, sorry. So going back to the UX problems that we mentioned before, we know that there's uh, navigation problems, there's lack of big pictures, we want to be welcoming to new members, uh, there's this problem there's no search, there's a lack of saliency uh, in the list and posts, and there's limited user interaction in terms of enabling uh, intra-list collaboration. This is a recapping kind of what we covered in the first part of the, of the presentation. So these are all the just kind of once we, when we want to kind of pare down the brainstorming ideas, we want to go back to this list of problems because we want to make sure all the features that we're creating are addressing in some aspect these problems, right? So for um, one example we did is we took the list page of the old Piper Mail and we kind of um, notated where the problems of each of these, um, some of these like the navigation, the saliency issues. And so for example, you can see that, you know, there's, you know, for example, could these be grouped together? Or is this group still active? So basically it's trying to saying, how can we highlight some context in these lists? So this is, again, going back to the problems we saw before and notating the features and seeing if we can um, uh, kind of intersect the brainstorming ideas with the UX problems. And so having kind of that uh, paring down the ideas is a lot of kind of logistics and kind of 
um, figuring out analytically what's the best course of action. And so what um, Maureen did after that is that uh, she came, came up with this site map, if you will, which is a, a, like an interaction flow. And so from here, she kind of says, OK, if we break down the list um, or the mailing list UI into these kinds of pages, it's, uh, it will flow better. It will address some of the issues we have. And it introduces some new features. So we can see some new features. Like on the right, there's this tag and categories, which we didn't have before. We have search introduced here. Um, and then we have this profile thing here. So these are some new features that weren't in Pipermail, but are in HyperKitty now. And, uh, and then we have all this. Uh, really list overview that's a lot richer than before. And so this is, again, just uh, kind of abstracting everything we did in the pare down exercise into a sitemap that you know, we can then give a front end person to kind of write out all the pages that need to be done. So from here, we can do uh, mockups. Right? Uh, again, going off the sitemap is, is a really good way to find what are the high priority pages we should do first, and so that we can get an interaction flow actually working. Um, uh, traditionally, you can do either low uh, fidelity or high fidelity. Low fidelity, by that I mean you can do wireframes, uh, which are kind of stencils of web pages, or you can sketch them, which is pen and paper. Um, or you can go high fidelity, which is like either graphical uh, or non-interactive or HTML doing um, interactive version. So what we did is we did the high fidelity version. Um, but from there, we kind of, after that, we just built it um, uh, and integrated it with the built back end. So we're going to jump ahead and do the integration part. Um, so just to give you a, a look of how it, a feel how it looks. So this is the old uh, list of mailing lists. Um, and then the, this is how it looks now, which is a lot different. We have uh, some key features. Uh, oh, it doesn't line up. But anyways, we have, um, we have search, first and foremost, in the upper right corner. We also have the statistics um, here, We have which are demonstrating kind of the amount of activity in a list as well as um, the participants uh, and the number of like threads that are going on. And on the left, we have this inactive and uh, private list. So these are filters that you can hide or show these kinds of attributes. And so again, it's, the, it's essentially the same content. It's, you could argue that it's uh, less compact, but uh, it's a lot more navigable uh, for would-be contributors. And it's a lot more cleaner in the sense that we can, at a glance, get a sense of, OK, what are the groups that are really active right now or have been active and aren't active anymore? And so at a glance, you can get a lot more information than that flat list that you had before. So, so this is the redesign of the kind of the index page, the home page, if you will. Um, this is the old version of what you would get when you drill down into a particular list. And this is the new version. So um, we have a couple of. Uh, features here. We have navigation, which is where you can jump to the particular month. And so um, on the left and on the right, we have activity summary. Or in the middle, we have activity summary and most active posters. So these are, again, a type of way to, at a glance, get a sense of what's going on, on in this list. The, the graph is basically a more zoomed in version of, of what was on the, the, the previous page. But most active posters gives us an idea of uh, who, who are the main contributors to this list. So, Potentially, because uh, we can see in these profiles there are you know, um, names and, and avatar photos. If you recognize some of these people, it could sway whether you want to participate or do not want to participate in a list. Um, and on the right, of course, we have search again, which is a key feature that was missing before. And uh, yet another way to um, capture uh, activity in a particular thread this time. So this is how many people are on a thread, how many um, posts are in a thread. And then we're introducing this new thing, which you can th uh, vote up or vote down a thread. So this is to get away from trolls again, or flame wars, or what or whatnot. So that if you have limited time to look at some thread or some mailing list, this is a quick way to say, okay, maybe I can skip over that thread and go to another thread. So these again are just some shortcuts in terms of visual cues that we're providing to users that uh, were very hard to see before, and they're now easier to see now. Uh, we're introducing new features like categories. Um, so this is a sense of some adding more organization to the mailing list. Uh, this is a way we can say, OK, whether a particular uh, mailing list tends to be more inflammatory or more question and answer. Um, theoretically, we can also apply this all the way down to uh, thread level. But for now, we're, um, the feature is now just going to be applied to mailing list level. Um, 
But yeah, so we can also, uh, once you drill down into a particular category, you can see which mailing lists have that category. So um, user profiles are something that wasn't there before that we're going to introduce now. Uh, this is a lot more complicated of a feature. And so some of the back end are still in process of being implemented. But the idea that we have right now, um, so the front end is stubbed out already. So we're just waiting for the back end. But uh, what we have here is for this particular user, what, uh, what mailing lists are they active on? Have they recently posted? And then we have this new feature about like, what are some characteristics of this user? So does he tend to have a low volume or does he tend to have posts that people like, vote up? Or, uh, and so these are basically a way to do reputation, uh, a quick reputation check on a user. So again, it, for people who are new to a mailing list, this is another way that they can get a sense of a context of someone's message. So maybe this uh, user is always commenting in a certain way, and so this kind of grounds grounds that conversation for, for people who are kind of re, uh, looking in from the outside. And uh, particular to Fedora, we, uh, there are Fedora badges that we can also include in the user profile page. Um, what we also did is the last feature is uh, added responsive design. So for those that don't know what responsive design is, it's basically kind of adapting content in terms of layout um, that makes it more amenable to different devices, different size devices. So for in this example, you know, you're going from a very uh, large uh, desktop screen and making it layout is a fluid layout, what they call, uh, so that it scales very well so that if you had a smaller device, say a phone or um, or what they call phablets now, phones, t phone tablets, and then uh, that I would scale appropriately, right? So uh, at first glance, um, a lot of people think, oh, there's nothing to responsive design. It's basically something you can stick a Band-Aid on at the, end, at the end of your front end development. But actually, there are a couple of kind of uh, details that are really important to note when you do responsive design. So one of the things that you know uh, that you need to consider responsive design is because you get little problems like this. Basically, as you scale down your device uh, window size, you'll get some overlapping elements, um, or things don't look, or grid as well. So we have some alignment issues on the right. We have some overlapping issues with the graph. So these are all kind of hints that you know perhaps you should do some responsiveness or add some responsiveness to your site. Uh, so the surface fix, as I was saying, is uh, something called media queries. And so this is a CSS technique. You can just add it to um, your style sheets. Uh, for instance, this uh, query says, this me particular media query says, uh, for screens that are uh, at most 700 pixels, uh, then we're going to add, we're going to change the styles uh, for content and sidebar to be these um, characteristics, right? So. This is saying, and then if, if your window gets uh, larger than 700 pixels, these, this wouldn't apply anymore. So media queries is a really convenient way to kind of conditionally apply certain styles depending on the size of your, uh, the viewport, viewport, if you will, of your browser window, right? So which would change based on the size of your device. Um, but the key thing to know with uh, responsive design is that the same code uh, gets loaded no matter what your device is. So if your phone and your uh, computer or your desktop uh, would, would get the same page, the same style sheets downloaded. So even though you're applying media queries to it, the same amount of uh, HTML gets loaded in. So you gotta, uh, if we want to consider things like performance, which could be important when we're talking about maybe uh, devices that are slower processors or whatnot, or older devices, then we can start being a little clever in how we apply um, the style sheets and the media queries. So for example, if we look on the left, we see by default we have um, two uh, classes and they're float left by default and then we apply um, a media query that says when you're, uh, when you're up to uh, 320 pixels, we're gonna reset you to nothing, right? So this is kind of saying when you're small, 320 is kind of like really old iPhone um, size, we're gonna not float, but otherwise we're gonna float left, right? Um, the one on the right says, uh, by default, float is none, right? CSS styles say, say that by, if you didn't specify foo and bar, it's going to be float none. But this says when you're at least 960 pixels, which means you're you know, really large, usually this is like laptop size, laptop or desktop, um, then we're going to float left. So we see there's a lot, uh, there's a few lines of codes in the style sheet on the right. Um, 
and then on the left. And so the, the right is actually kind of considering mobile first. It's, it's, placing, it's considering the smaller uh, screen as the initial kind of design, which is float left. And then we're saying that as you get bigger, then you can adjust the, the non-floats to be uh, something else, right? So the difference uh, in this case, is in this kind of simple example, is, is a few lines. But the consequence of it is that if we consider in a larger kind of site, is that you could load less style sheets or styles, and then this could imp uh, help improve your performance if it uh, if you had a really complicated site and this scaled. So uh, less CSS means you have a smaller footprint, which could lead to faster loading depending on um, how many styles we're talking about. Um, we also another consideration when you do responsive design is kind of the layout and the information flow. So obviously when you talk about scaling down to a small device, you have a lot less pixels, pixels to deal with. So uh, you have to consider what content is most important. Uh, if you, in a web page, there's all this notion of below the fold, fold kind of thing. So on a device, it's a very uh, similar thing. You know, there's only, uh, ideally you wouldn't uh, require the user to scroll so much on their, on their device. So they can, but you know, if, they, if important information is always at the bottom of your page, eventually, it's going to, uh, you know, maybe annoy the users. So, but the trade-off to that is that there's this familiarity to uh, consider. So, if users always log into your site and and are very conditioned to think that, you know, uh, this element is always to the right of this other element, and then on the device it's like totally different, or the element is now gone. So, uh, this could like disorient users. So, kind of you have to prioritize content, but also consider that there is some. Uh, similarities you need to carry over across devices. And uh, navigation is, is one example of where this familiarity is, is really important. So people are used to jumping to certain sections and you remove that navigational element when you scale down. People can get thrown off by that. So some examples of, of different navigations, we, uh, we actually did this in, in our responsive design. And so this is one of the things we have to test out with users to see if this is too confusing or not. Um, so, for example, we see there's a sort by here that when we c uh, have a smaller screen, it gets uh, into a drop-down menu. When it gets into kind of the tablet uh, resolution, it's now this on, on the top bar, the almost uh, most active, most popular, newest. But when you get to desktop kind of scale, it's now, a si ooh, it's now a sidebar. Sorry, it's now a sidebar. So we see that there's different navigational uh, styles or navigational kind of UI that we've done, and so whether this kind of will negatively impact users is something we have to see and get feedback from. Um, another example of this is this very complicated uh, kind of three column layout for the list overview. When we collapse it into a very small device uh, like the phone, we've now got this kind of sectioning for the content, right? We got a tab based uh, navigation and drop down boxes. So whether this is to uh, th whether this kind of tab base kind of buries content too much is, is another thing we're going to have to get feedback on. But these are all kind of considerations that, you know, w we chose the nav uh, tab based navigation to emphasize kind of what we thought was, you know, the first tab is more important than the second tab, which is more important than the third tab. But um, this is kind of designer imposing an uh, of information flow. So this is, again, something we would need feedback from. So moving forward, what, what's next in terms of responsive design, um, there's this uh, citation that says, you know, actually 3% of responsive sites don't have, or have smaller footprints. So most sites don't have a smaller footprint, which is actually unfortunate because they're not leveraging kind of the full power of what it means to be a responsive site for small screens. And so uh, we like to, you know, we could be part of the majority, 97%, or we could be better. And so I, um, I like to kind of take it, uh, uh, so I, I was the one who worked on the responsive part, design part, so I'd like to kind of make sure that I can improve the kind of f performance footprint. Um, we also like to future proof the responsiveness. So what I mean by this is, if you notice in the media query, there's these breakpoints that was like 320 pixels or 700 pixels. Uh, kind of when responsiveness first came out, a lot of the breakpoints were ba based on the width of device screens. So like iPhones are like 320 pixels back then. So that's kind of why we, uh, you might see 320 pixels a lot. But you know, as we all know, devices are coming out left and right every day. So um, sticking with and, and their resolutions, whether they're retina or not, kind of influences the breakpoints. So actually, what's a better way to kind of future-proof it is to create your breakpoints that are based on content instead. 
So kind of lay out your page however you will, and then you know, increase or decrease the, um, uh, the browser window. And wherever your content kind of breaks, either the flow doesn't look right or the layout doesn't look right, then that's where you should put the breakpoint. So kind of do your breakpoints on content versus uh, device. The way it's built um, now, it's um, built on kind of bootstrap and bootstrap, Twitter's bootstrap, so, uh, which is very heavily um, device oriented instead of content oriented. So uh, the kind of the next step is to maybe move away from all the, the, you know, the built-in uh, media queries that you get from bootstrap and kind of do, do it based on content. Um, this also, we need to continue brainstorming and get feedback on. As you notice, the, the, list, of, the list overview and the mailing list uh, index page, it's kind of looking sort of like a forum. There's qualities of the UI that's very uh, forum-like versus mailing list-like. And so there's this, um, and this, this kind of gets into uh, subjective debates and, and whatnot. But the idea is like, uh, which, how much of the forum features do we want and how much do we want to keep the, the kind of very trimmed down feature set of the old, old mailing list interactions. So kind of this balance and figuring out are users amenable to this or are they not amenable and figuring out which ones are actually really useful. I mean, we could implement features for the sake of implementing them, but that's actually, I'd like to think that's not the right way to approach um, kind of ro newing, rolling out a new version of things. So, uh, so yeah. So of course, and also you guys can also get involved in the project if you like. We have a demo server, which um, usually has maybe some extra changes beyond the beta, but uh, sometimes it's slow, but it, it's usually up. You can try it. Um, you can help us report bugs. You can check out the code. It's hosted on GitHub. Um, you can try it installing yourself. And you can always email us if you have uh, ideas about what to do with the project. Uh, and that's it. Oh, thank you. I'll also like to acknowledge, so Maureen did, the, did a lot of the graphic or the interactions before, up until the um, kind of the front end development, and uh, Aurelian is um, the back end guy. So, so with him, uh, their help, uh, I did a lot of the work. And then um, I also like to thank Gnome because this project was based on the outreach program for women internship that I did. So I'll thank them as well. Thank you. Uh, so I did a lot of, um, so responsive design, because there's so much, I personally feel it's, it's much like a puzzle, because you have to figure out, oh, does this, should it go here, should it go here? So I did a lot of it first in kind of um, the high fidelity graphics, so like Inkscape and layout and stuff like that. And then once I um, kind of get a, get a flow that I like, the layout that I like, I kind of pass it around and everyone thinks, get feedback from them, and then I do the front end, uh, the actual like, uh, HTML interactive version. So I do. I still do a lot of kind of non-interactive puzzle layout. I really feel like I'm puzzling. I shuffle places, uh, chunks of the of the page around to see which ones make sense or not. So yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a lot of people helped out. So, but thank you. Oh, versus device breakpoint yeah, thing? Like, yeah, so, so it's, if you do content base, it's, it's basically me dragging a browser window and then, um, and then seeing where the, so I'll, I'll take a step back. So, so um, fluid layouts, all, responsive design is just all based on fluid layouts, which means, uh, which is enabled by Twitter's bootstrap. And so what bootstrap does is it gives you a grid system and it takes care of, if you use the variables it gives you, it will take care of changing the, uh, the layout. So if you say, when I'm a big screen, I want, um, I want things to be like all in a row, three things all in a row. And then as you shrink the browser, you know, three things will become two things and then this will like shift down. And even smaller and then they get stacked like one on top of each other. So Twitter takes care of the kind of um, the floats, if you will, what floats where and what position where if you use the Twitter um, grid system. So, um, so what, what the breakpoints do is kind of at what point do you shift down, right? At what point do you go from three in a row to uh, two on a row and then one here to you know, all stacked, 
right? So um, if you didn't use grid, the Twitter bootstrap system, what would happen is that as you shrink, you'd have to scroll like your page and then, you know, which is also not, when you're on a very small screen can be not user friendly. So, um, so it's nice to have the fluid design, which is basically the re repositioning of elements. And so what Twitter does though, is all the breakpoints are based on um, kind of pre-established uh, device screen size. So you can see this in their, in their style sheets, their code, which is on GitHub, so it's open, open source. So you can see it says, you know, 320 pixels is a small phone. And then there, there's another, um, you know, 680, 768, these, you know, it's tablet size. They even, you know, they label it based on like device names, right? And, and you can reference it by that name too. It's like um, the variable name is actually like small phone and tablet size, you know. So it's, it's very clearly device space. But, um, you know, iPhones now are not 320 uh, pixels, right? Especially if you have the latest one, which is Retina. Um, so, so basing those off the variables kind of makes your code a little less readable because as, as kind of the, the device landscape improves, right? So basing it off your content, I, and this is kind of like a personal uh, judgment, like coding style, I, I guess. But personally, I feel like it's, it's better in terms of as we move forward, who knows what devices will come up. Maybe we'll go back to, we're getting larger devices now, but maybe one day we'll go back to smaller devices. Who knows, right? And, uh, um, and so kind of basing it on your content and thinking that, you know, my content is this width and I will, at this width, I will want to change it, right? So if I have a three column layout, um, that's gonna be a different kind of breakpoint than if I have a single column layout. A single column layout, I can probably get away with very few breakpoints, right? So, but if I have three columns like we do in the list overview, it's the, the resizing could be based on the three columns width or what is a reasonable width for each column. Does that make sense? Oh. Oh. Yes. So, um, actually, Twitter's uh, to the Bootstrap media queries are really bad at landscape versus portrait. Um, so, the portrait uh, and old, smaller devices like 320 one way. 480 the other way for landscape. There's actually no 480 uh, breakpoint or given to you in Bootstrap. Right, but but people, a lot of people kind of customize in uh, the Twitter, their, like through their own flavor of the Bootstrap because there are media query breakpoints that they're missing, like the 480, because they're like, oh, I want a website or I want um, my grid to support both landscape and portrait, and so I need this additional breakpoint, right? So. Um, so what we have now in, um, in HyperKitty is a custom flavor of the bootstrap. So adding these additional big points is uh, not a problem. So, um, because I, when I was doing it, I realized I didn't like the, the ones that were given. I thought they were not enough. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> that, that's a good question. Um, I, I haven't uh, installed it. I think there, there will be a package rollout in terms of there's, and there's a lot of new, because th I think there's even a new version of Python that it depends on. So that might be, that might be a big, big change for some folks. Um, it's 2.7 now, but I, I know in the to-do list there is to make it 3.0. So if we shift over to that, that could make people's lives difficult for some. So it's possible. Yeah. So that's the um, the other part of the, the list admin um, part of the mailman. Uh, so they have a web UI too, um, and it's now called Posterious. Uh, it still looks like the old way, unfortunately because no one's working on it, but I actually, I hope to work on it. Um, once I get the, everything's like nailed down in the HyperKitty UI, uh, I'd like, because on their, on the posteriors team, what they want to do is kind of make the UI similar. It would be very disjointed for them to have the old style for that part and then the new style for, for the archiver part. That's, um, 
if if things go as is, that might end up what happen what will happen. But I'd like to. Um, there's no unfortunately there's no set date for the the non beta release. So, um, but this is on their to do list, kind of to make the UIs equivalent. Uh, no, I, cust I customize it so that we can now add more or do different media queries. Oh, okay. So, yes. It's not, but it can support it now. So, I just, you know, that was the latest. One of the latest things I did is kind of ported my own version of Bootstrap. So, if you will, it's like forking, if you will. But um, basically, it's the, the same base of Bootstrap with some additional variables that I define. And so right now it's still device based, but I didn't like it. So I, I, and, and at that point we weren't using a custom flavor, but now we're using a custom flavor. And so that will be, oh, has, oh. is not yet, but okay. it's very easy to do yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so yes, yeah, back to you. Yes, privacy was a big thing, and I think um, that has been one of the um, concerns maybe that the back end hasn't been implemented all the way yet because we're still in discussion. A lot of the things, uh, particularly about that middle section, about the characteristics like um, your posts tend to be shorter or longer or thumbed up or thumbed down, you know, these are kind of revealing traits that, not that are impossible to get, but we've just made it a lot easier to get now. And so um, from a from, you know, if that was my profile, that might be information I'm not willing to share so readily. So um, that's, uh, so we're kind of thinking about which, should that whole section be like opt-in or should there be some kind of default, but very basic characteristics are shared, but then maybe advanced characteristics are, are not shared. So it's in discussion, so. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the news feed and Facebook problem. The news feed was not revealing more information, but it's now made it so much easier to get. So yeah, it's a, it's a good point, yeah. Right, 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 right. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Dad talks all the time and mom doesn't talk, yeah. So yeah, that's that's very true. And so um, the and another reason why the admin UI should be kind of synced in and and, and in line with what we're doing here. So yeah, great. Right. Thanks. <laughs>